So when it comes to defining my favourite Star Wars film, it actually is a very difficult one to do because do I go back in time to when I first saw A New Hope or do I answer the call that is within my heart and say, actually, I loved Rogue One so very much. But you know what, even if it isn't your favourite film, many can agree that it's still one of the better produced ones in the entire franchise. And you know what, I'm going to share that love with you today. As I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and these are 20 things you didn't know about Rogue One. Number 20, Rooney Mara, Kate Mara, and Tatiana Maslany were considered for Jin Erso. Now, it's a foregone conclusion that the lead in any Star Wars movie will be massively sought out by even Hollywood A-listers, with the final casting choice being made after only extensive audition processes. And though the part of Jin Erso ultimately went to Felicity Jones, a number of acclaimed and beloved actresses were also under heavy consideration. Rooney Mara ended up meeting with director Gareth Edwards for the part, though ultimately decided to withdraw herself before auditions due to her busy schedule. Rooney's sister Kate Mara was also in the mix, reportedly being screen tested for the part of Jin, yet perhaps perhaps most enticingly of all, Orphan Black's Tatiana Maslane was also screen tested as well. It's especially easy to picture Tatiana bringing her own uniquely fiery energy to the part, though Jones certainly did a solid job on her own merits. Number 19. The story was pitched by VFX legend John Knoll after Disney's purchase of Lucasfilms. Rogue One was greenlit under the most uncommon of all circumstances, with the original pitch actually being conceptualized by none other than legendary VFX artist John Knoll. Knoll, a 35-year industry veteran who worked extensively on the Star Wars prequels, got word that Disney were planning a series of Star Wars spin-off movies, and after hearing some less-than-inspired concepts, got to work on his own. He first had the idea of a direct prequel to A New Hope a decade prior, with the story intended to become an episode of the scrapped live-action series Star Wars Underworld. Once Disney acquired Lucasfilm, Noll returned to the idea, workshopping it with a few employees of the VFX house Industrial Light & Magic before shaping it into a half-hour pitch that he was encouraged to present to Lucasfilm president Kathleen Kennedy. Kennedy loved it, greenlit the movie, and Noll ended up with executive producer and story by credits while also working as the film's visual effects supervisor. Number 18. Numerous titles were considered before Rogue One as perfect as the title Rogue One is, it was a good old while before the filmmakers and producers all settled on it. Back when it was still planned to be part of the overall Skywalker saga rather than a delineated spin-off, Rogue One was given a more traditional Star Wars-y subtitle like Rise of the Empire, Shadow of the Death Star, and Dark Times. They all seemed to fit with the Star Wars naming conventions, yet in a totally generic and unimaginative way. And so the crew were smart to do away with this entirely when they decided that Rogue One would be a distinct offshoot of the mainline franchise. Number 17. It was the first live-action Star Wars film without an opening title crawl. It's surprisingly easy to forget that Rogue One is the first live-action Star Wars film not to feature the traditional text title crawl in its opening sequence. It is, of course, a hallmark of the franchise, and though 2008's animated film Star Wars The Clone Wars also didn't feature the crawl, Rogue One was the first major Star Wars movie to go without it. Gareth Edwards confirmed that this decision was made before shooting started to help differentiate the film from the seven live-action Star Wars movies that had preceded it. He also said of his decision, The idea is that the film is supposed to be different than the saga film. There's this feeling that if we did a crawl, then it will create another movie. As much as the lack of a crawl left some fans disappointed, it was an elegantly simple way to distinguish Rogue One from the saga movies. Number 16. Unused footage from A New Hope was included in the film. Though the film's digitally assisted depictions of both Grand Moff Tarkin and Princess Leia proved relatively controversial with fans and commentators, few were left complaining about a sneaky feat of resurrection that they probably never even noticed. The film actually features unused footage of Red Leader Garvin and Gold Leader John that was shot for A New Hope almost 40 years prior, recycled here as part of the climactic Battle of Scarif. Edwards and his production team went on a tour of Skywalker Ranch and ended up discovering the unused material, which he was consequently able to include in the film as a neat little easy Easter egg for fans. Number 15. Aaron Paul, Edgar Ramirez, and Sam Claflin were considered for Cassian Andor. There was a major casting call to find the film's male lead Cassian Andor, as of course eventually went to the great Diego Luna. But prior to this, a number of high-profile and rising actors alike were also in consideration, including none other than Breaking Bad star Aaron Paul. Alongside Paul, Edgar Ramirez was also courted to possibly play Cassian, and perhaps the most left field of all of the three other prospects was Brit actor Sam Claflin. Curiously, Claflin was rumoured to appear in the film as Bodhi Rook, so it's likely that Claflin made it quite far into the process before it just didn't work out for whatever reason. In the end, it's tough to argue with Luna's rendition of Cassian, which has turned out to be quite the lucrative role given that Luna recently wrapped shooting of the Disney Plus spin-off series Andor. 
Number 14. The Hilarious Origins of the Planet Named Scarif Rogue One features one of the most distinctive locales from any Star Wars movie in Scarif, the remote tropical planet which contained an imperial base vital for the construction of the Death Star. While the name fits in perfectly with the Star Wars naming convention, director Gareth Edwards actually came up with the planet's moniker at a Starbucks of all places. In his own words, he said, I go over to get a coffee from Starbucks and I'm thinking, what could the name of this planet be? It could be this, maybe we could use that. Then at the very end, she gives me the drink and they must have asked my name and I must have said, it's Gareth, but they heard Scarif. They wrote Scarif on the cup and I was like, that sounds like Star Wars. I went back in and just gave it to the writers and went, it's called Scarif. Number 13. Chirrut Imwe was almost played by Jet Li. Though it might be difficult to imagine anyone but the inimitable Donnie Yen playing the badass blind warrior Chirrut Imwe, the part very nearly went to fellow martial arts legend Jet Li. Lucasfilms only ever considered Yen and Li for the role, the two arguably being the most iconic and bankable cinematic martial artists of their time, but Yen ultimately won out because his salary demands were considerably lower. Though there are disputes about precisely how much he was paid for the part, he is said to have requested considerably less than Li. While Yen was initially hesitant to accept the part due to it taking him away from his home for several months, his young son's fondness for Star Wars ultimately convinced him to play the part. And considering that he was easily one of the most entertaining factors of Rogue One, it was certainly to the fans' gain. Number 12. The film underwent heavy reshoots it's not exactly a secret that Rogue One underwent considerable reshoots during post-production, though you might not be quite aware of just how pervasive the additional photography actually was. Almost none of the footage featured in Rogue One's first teaser trailer was included in the final theatrical release, such as the memorable shot of Jin walking out onto a catwalk and being met by a TIE fighter. After principal photography was completed, the third act was massively reworked, with Bourne franchise writer Tony Gilroy being paid $5 million to spend 12 weeks fixing both the finale, both with rewrites and with overseeing reshoots. Gilroy, who received a screenwriting credit, said that the film was in terrible, terrible trouble when he came aboard. Originally, much of the finale involved the rebels running across Scarif's beach to transmit the Death Star's plans, but Gilroy was instrumental in compressing down this part of the mission, heavily rewriting it to be more efficient. Though we'll never know exactly how much of Rogue One was refilmed, estimates run as high as 40%, and given that the reshoots ended up lasting almost two months, that's an easy figure to believe. Number 11. The musical score was written in just a month. Rogue One was only the second Star Wars film not to have its score composed by the brilliant John Williams, and the film's extensive reshoots ultimately resulted in Michael Giacchino writing the score in just a month. Originally, Alexandre Desplat was hired to score the movie, but was eventually replaced due to scheduling issues, as he was unavailable to rework his score to accommodate the changes of the heavy reshoots. Fresh off completing his score for Doctor Strange, Giacchino only had a month to write the music for Rogue One, likely explaining why the score borrows so liberally from Williams' own prior work. Ultimately, it's impressive that the score turned out so well considering the enormous hurry that he must have been in. You'd certainly never get that impression from just listening to it. Number 10. Galen Erso was inspired by J. Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb. One of Rogue One's most important characters is Jin's father, Galen Erso, a research scientist who reluctantly aided the creation of the Death Star, and who of course built the infamous exhaust port floor into it as a failsafe. Galen was in fact modelled after J. Robert Oppenheimer, the American theoretical physicist who became the father of the atomic bomb. Much like Erso, Oppenheimer expressed considerable guilt over his part in helping create a weapon of mass destruction. Given that Rogue One is heavily inspired by real-life warfare, namely the Vietnam War, it's fitting that one of its central characters characters would be loosely based on an instrumental historical figure. Number 9. The marketing was delayed because of a Mission Impossible sequel Though it's pretty much expected that any other blockbuster movie would move the hell out of Star Wars' unstoppable way, Paramount actually came to a unique pact with Disney over Rogue One's marketing. Because both parties were concerned about audiences being confused by Rogue One and 2015's Mission Impossible sequel Rogue Nation, the studios agreed to create a distinct distance between their marketing campaigns. Disney agreed not to excessively promote Rogue One beyond the release of its teaser trailer before Rogue Nation's mid-2015 release to ensure clean separation in the public consciousness. With Rogue One ultimately not releasing until almost 18 months after Rogue Nation, Disney had plenty of time to get the hype machine running. Number 8. The script was worked on by six screenwriters Though Rogue One has only got two credited screenwriters, a total of six different scribes ended up contributing to the film, and that's without including John Knoll's initial pitch of the idea. After Earth's writer Gary Witter took a first pass at the script and then went on to receive a story by credit alongside Knoll, while Christopher McQuarrie, Scott Z. Burns, and Michael Arndt are all said to have provided uncredited contributions or script polishes during development. The bulk of the final script was penned by Chris Weitz, with Tony Gilroy receiving a co-writing credit for his work on the reshoots. That's six big-name screen 
screenwriters involved with the film's creative, such that it's incredibly surprising that the end result actually turned out as cohesively as it did. We've seen the too many cooks situation ruin too many blockbuster films, but thankfully this wasn't the case here. Number 7. It's the first Star Wars film not to include a Wilhelm scream. The Wilhelm scream is one of the most iconic, recognizable, and infuriatingly overused sound effects in all of cinema, and prior to Rogue One had appeared in every single Star Wars movie, including The Clone Wars. But following the release of The Force Awakens, franchise sound editor Matthew Wood decided to move on from the cliched, immersion-shattering scream such that it didn't appear in Rogue One and hasn't been used since in a Star Wars film. Wood did, however, decide to fill the void by including a new recurring sound effect called the George, though as of yet hasn't actually confirmed what that sound effect actually is. Number 6. Jin's mother was a Jedi in earlier drafts of the script in an earlier version of the film's script, Jin's mother was written to be a Jedi, but this was eventually changed amidst the belief that it was more interesting to simply examine the lives of more normal citizens of the galaxy. Gareth Edwards said, The prologue, at one point a long time ago, was going to be the Empire coming to kill the Jedi, and Jin's mum was going to be a Jedi. We were witnessing one of those kills, and Krennic would be the person sent to do it. This was possibly a good call, all things considered. Star Wars already has enough problems with characters being implausibly linked to the Force, and not every new hero needs to be a somebody. Number 5. Blue Squadron was originally intended to appear in A New Hope in addition to the Red and Gold Squadrons, the Battle of Scarif also featured the new Blue Squadron, which curiously enough was actually intended to show up in A New Hope's final battle. However, the blue colorings of the spacecrafts caused technical issues with the cutting-edge blue screen technology being used during A New Hope's effects-heavy sequences, and so the color was changed to red. For four decades on, compositing technology has evolved enough that that just isn't a problem, and so Blue Squadron could easily be reintegrated. And by having the entire squadron go down on the Battle of Scarif, there's a plausible reason for their lack of presence in a new hope and beyond. Number 4. Peter Cushing's estate had a major input on Grand Moff Tarkin's presence Peter Cushing played Grand Moff Tarkin in A New Hope, and the actor's likeness was rather controversially reappropriated for the character's appearance in Rogue One. Actor Guy Henry served as Cushing's stand-in on set, as well as providing the voice for the character, with a digital model of Cushing's likeness from A New Hope being layered over the top. In terms of the ethics of digitally resurrecting an actor without their consent, Lucasfilm not only sought permission from the late actor's estate, but also consulted with the family on his appearance in the final film. The estate reportedly was heavily involved in even minor adjustments to his mannerisms during post-production, and while the debate continues about the character's inclusion to this day, it sounds like Lucasfilm did everything within their power to render the character respectfully. Number 3. Dermot Mulroney has a secret role in this film Though it's not uncommon for name actors to make secret appearances in Star Wars movies under the guise of, say, a stormtrooper like Daniel Craig did, the great Dermot Mulroney had an untold role in Rogue One that you'd never be able to guess. As it turns out, he's actually an accomplished cellist and has been playing the instrument since his high school days, to the extent that he regularly performs in Michael Giacchino's orchestral sessions for movie scores. Between 2006 and 2018, he played cello for the scores of Mission Impossible 3, Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, Star Trek Into Darkness, Star Trek Beyond The Incredibles 2, and indeed Rogue One. It's quite the unique credit for an actor to receive in a Star Wars film, distinguishing him with a cameo quite unlike anybody else in the franchise. Number 2. Jin and Cassian originally survived the movie one of Rogue One's biggest surprises is that it actually commits to killing off all of its main characters, especially Jin and Cassian who are obliterated when the Death Star fires at Scarif. The temptation must have been there to keep Jin and Cassian alive for future adventures, enough that the first draft of the screenplay indeed had them survive. However, Gareth Edwards wanted the pair to die, and during a meeting with Kathleen Kennedy expressed this desire, to which Kennedy surprisingly agreed, giving him the nod to kill them off for good. While Cassian will obviously be making a return in his Disney Plus prequel series, it's still ballsy to unambiguously kill two well-received characters who could have easily been spun off into their own cinematic trilogy. And number one, George Lucas reportedly preferred this to The Force Awakens. When George Lucas sold Lucasfilm to Disney, he relinquished the rights to have any creative say over the future direction of Star Wars, though he was periodically consulted during development of the sequel trilogy. In 2019, the CEO at Disney revealed that George Lucas wasn't exactly thrilled about the direction of Star Wars The Force Awakens, feeling as many fans did that it lacked originality. Yet according to Gareth Edwards, Lucas was extremely happy with how Rogue One turned out, and given Lucas's lukewarm verdict on The Force Awakens, it's clear which of the two he prefers. Considering that Rogue One wasn't merely 
a retelling of what came before and actually tried to do something different with the IP, it's not terribly surprising that he favoured it over effectively a veiled remake of A New Hope. And there we go, my friends. Those were 20 things you didn't know about Star Wars Rogue One. I hope that you enjoyed that, and please let me know what you thought about it down in the comments section below. As always, I've been Jules. You can go follow me over on Twitter at RetroJ with a zero, or you can swing by Live and Let's Dice, where I do all of my streaming outside of work, as well as my Warhammer battle reports. So if you're into that sort of thing, it'd be great to see you over there. But before I go, I just want to say one thing. Hope you're treating yourself well with love and respect, my friend, because you deserve all of the best things in life, and do not let anything or anyone else tell you otherwise, all right? You're a massive ledge. I want you to go out there and smash it today. Big love to you. As always, I've been Jules. You have been awesome. Never forget that, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.